Uh, Mr. Rahul Bajaj, whom I've known now for many years, <clears throat> Dr. Purvis Grant Brachi, Mr. Botes. Uh, at the outset, let me thank you for inviting me <clears throat> as the chief guest to this function. At the outset also, let me congratulate Ruby Hall for his fantastic achievement. I congratulate the whole lot of you, the doctors, the administrators, the nursing staff, the house staff, for really bringing about a true revolution in medicine, in this, not only in this part of the country, but in the whole country. It is really a feat worth admiring and worth applauding. I'm going to speak very simply on some basic aspects of medicine. The first question I would put is, what is a good critical care unit? How would you grade a critical care unit? Even the lay person would say, it all depends how many ill people come into the unit and how many live and go out of the unit. In other words, the mortality. One shouldn't be deceived just by mortality rates reported by people. Mortality rates in a critical care unit should be related to the gravity and the criticality of the illness with which the patients are admitted. So ideally speaking, a critical care unit at least sometimes, once in two years at least, should score patients that come to them. A SOFA score, for example, is simple enough and then find out that those with bad SOFA scores, moderately bad SOFA scores, how do they fare? What is their morbidity and what is their mortality? And if that is reasonably good, then you can equate yourself to a good critical care unit. The rate of nosocomial infections also marks a good or a bad unit. The presence of a strong infection control committee which honestly reports the nature and degree of infections within the unit is also extremely important. With it also, the sort of organisms that prevail in a critical care unit and their sensitivity to various antibiotics. As you know, we are faced with the dreadful problem of dreadful organisms resistant to many antibiotics and sometimes to most antibiotics. And that is posing an increasing problem to all critical units in this country, more so in this country than in other parts of the world. And finally, a very simple thing. How many bed sores does the unit have within a month? It's a very simple test as to how good the nursing and the doctoring is. It's also important to take the patient's aspect. What does the patient feel about the critical care unit? The care, the compassion, the attention, nurses, doctors. What is the noise level in the unit? All these are small factors, but important factors, which tell you whether a unit is good or not. I'm sure, Prachi, your unit is very good. Let me now... <laughs> Let me now give you, some, give you some thoughts of mine on the changing face of medicine and also, therefore, the changing approach of the medical profession to this changing aspect of medicine. The great leaps in science and technology have brought about miracles in the medical field. Medicine is capable of performing feats which would have been deemed impossible 50 or 70 years ago. But strangely enough, I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, why is it that the medical profession is held in a certain degree of antagonism by the lay public? Why is it that the profession enjoyed a great reputation in times past when there was very little science and technology? Why so? I feel that the mechanization of medicine, the hubris of a science and technology, 
has robbed medicine, submerged the art within medicine, has robbed it of its raison d'etre, of its humanism. The doctor today, I see, particularly the younger ones, relate more to the machine than to the patient. The machine has become the interface between the doctor and the patient. And what is sad, the patient is also made to relate more to the machine than to the doctor. What does that lead to? It leads to a loosening and an erosion of a bond between the doctor and the patient. In clinical medicine, the bond between the doctor and the patient is the very core of medicine. It's the heart and soul of medicine. Today, I find that the physician, particularly the critical care physician, very often, does not consider the patient as a whole, but looks at different parts of his anatomy, tenders, to different organ functions, compartmentalizes the body into different organ functions. The patient as such, therefore, is often forgotten, relegated to the background. Make no mistake, science and technology is indeed extremely important. It is science and technology which has afforded medicine a quantum leap into the 21st century, as Mr. Boat rightly pointed out. But I'd like to point out particularly to my younger colleagues, the house physicians, the registrars, that there is far more to medicine than science and technology. Technology, for example, can, cannot substitute for a well-taken history. Nor can it substitute for a thoroughly done physical examination. Nor can it assuage the anxiety, the dread of patients who are critically ill, and the anxiety and the sorrow of relatives related to that patient. The advance of science and technology, so necessary in medicines, has unwittingly pushed the art of medicine into the background. You will ask me, what is the art of medicine that I'm talking about? The art of medicine is difficult to define in words. It consists of attributes of the mind and body which vibrate in empathy with the patient thereby hastening his cure, his relief. History taking, for example, is an art, an art which can never be perfected for several reasons. It is a lost art, I think. Look at the history today, I, at least where I work, look at the history taken by junior doctors on patients who are ill or who are not so ill. Physical examination, in part, is also an art. The eliciting of physical findings is an art. The interpretation is a science. That, too, is, I'm afraid, a lost art. How would I define the art of medicine? I've very often thought about this, and ultimately I came to this definition, my definition. I think the art of medicine is the artful relationship of the science of medicine to the holistic care of a human being or of a patient. That indeed is what the art of medicine is all about. Let me now go on one other aspect in relation to critical care medicine. Critical care medicine today all over the world is full of protocols. Protocols are important. I don't deny that. But protocols are not to be taken as the only Bible in critical care medicine. I'll give you an example. 
A patient who has a bad heart is a heart failure, has poor renal function, is vomiting blood, has had a stroke in the recent past. Which protocol, I ask you, are you going to follow in managing this patient? Protocols are important, but they more or less give you a very restricted view of what is happening. It's important to have a wider view. Another mantra in today's medicine is evidence-based medicine. It's like a standard bearer saying that without evidence-based medicine, you can't have medicine. Of course, evidence-based medicine is important. You need evidence to know whether what you are doing in the management of a patient is right or wrong. You can't do it on your individual fancy, fad or fancy or wish. That's true. It is even more important to know that whatever you are planning to do doesn't harm the patient. It's even more important. <clears throat> but I would like you to remember that even today, the greater part of medicine, including critical care medicine, is empiric in its nature. You know, the double-blind, randomized trials are the gold standard of evidence-based medicine. They're important. <clears throat> we should know them. We should realize their importance. But remember, the studies are on large populations. And the results of this, those studies need not be necessarily applied to the individual patient you're looking at or you're caring for. Observational studies come right down on the rung in relation to evidence-based medicine. But ladies and gentlemen, some of the greatest discoveries in medicine have been through great observations. Take the observations of Jenna in relation to smallpox vaccination. The observation of pasture in relation to vaccination, for example. The observations of blister in relation to the great monumental advances in surgery. The observation of Ignaz Semmelweis, who showed how important hand washing was in the prevention of infection. Again, Evidence is there, but evidence will change. Evidence is not sacrosanct. Had it been so, medicine would have been sterile, static. And history teaches us that medicine is dynamic, moving. Then we don't forget the importance of genes that's being realized today that why some patients respond to a specific treatment may be related to his genetic makeup and why some patients do not respond to a particular treatment may also be related to his genetic makeup. If that indeed is worked upon, you will have to rewrite the whole of evidence in medicine. So though evidence-based medicine is important, the old consultants, practicing consultants, Students, registrars, the staff must be familiar with evidence-based medicine. Please remember that though good, it is not infallible. Though important, it is not all-inclusive. And though it is applicable to many, it is not necessarily applicable to all. There are many other aspects to medicine. Social, economic, cultural, philosophical, religious, and many other factors which go to make the practice of medicine as it should be, which go to make a proper bond between the doctor and the patient. Let me now just go to the, some of the unfortunate side effects, shall we say, of critical care practice. How many of you have heard of Ivan Illich? His first edition was called Medical Nemesis. 
It was compulsory reading for all my registrars at the JJ Hospital. The second edition, which I would earnestly require you or advise you to look at, is called Limits to Medicine. Ivan Illich pointed out that medicine has three great disadvantages. The first was iatrogenic problems that it created, and he called that clinical iatrogenesis. The procedures that we perform, the drugs that we use, the medications that are given have effects, have side effects, can be harmful to the patient. And there has been a voluminous study and report of the number of injuries, including deaths that have been produced to patients as a result of what they call clinical iatrogenesis. Iatros is the phys means the physician, is the Greek word for the physician. Genesis is to make. Ivan Illich went on to say that the other disadvantage was social iatrogenesis, which means that the medical profession was so geared that it made society hopelessly dependent upon it. That was good for the medical profession, but not good for society at large. But what I'm most concerned about, particularly in relation to critical care, is what he termed is cultural iatrogenesis. What did he mean by cultural iatrogenesis? By cultural iatrogenesis, he meant that the medical profession was hell-bent on fighting death to the very end. And that can happen in a critical care unit, where you carry your care to the point of absurdity, where you made death prolong the act of dying, literally prolong the act of dying, making death gruesome, lonesome, and economically disastrous to the patient and to the family. This is extremely important, and we should therefore know our limits. Finally, I want to touch basically on some aspects of medical ethics. What is medical ethics? How would you consider medical ethics? Medical ethics is really just a branch of general ethics. You cannot divorce it from there. I would consider medical ethics or define medical ethics as moral considerations that govern the practice of medicine. The sense of right and wrong. Mind you, it's numerous societies in this world their concepts of right and wrong may differ from yours, but the basic concepts of right and wrong, the concept of the sanctity of life, ladies and gentlemen, is common to all civilizations. And where has medicine gone awry in its medical ethics? Let me just give just a few points on that. First, the lack of humanism. The humanism implies compassion, it implies care, it, impi it implies the ability, the quality to be able to be in empathy with what is wrong with the patient and to try one's best to set it right. That is what humanism is. After all, you must have heard of beneficence as one of the prime ethical qualities in medicine. Beneficence, of course, means that you have the expertise. You can't do without that. But beneficence also includes human qualities. Human qualities which are so important towards caring for the patient. That is the single most important factor which is lacking today, or which is being eroded today in medicine. I've already spoken to you about the mechanization of medicine, but much more worse is the commercialism of medicine. Where people feel, and you all know that, that doctors sometimes care more for money than for the patient. But it is true in many parts of our country, in many parts of the cities of this country. 
and in many parts of the world as well, not just in this country. Then look at the horrendous cost of medicine. A cost which can ruin a family. A critical illness lasting for about three or four weeks might cost about 40, 50 lakhs and wipe out the whole earnings of a middle class family. Isn't that horrendous? Can doctors do something about that? Well, yes. You can use less investigations, if possible, instead of many investigations. You could use simpler cures when they can achieve the same effect as the more expensive ones. Then comes the institutionalization of medicine. In Bombay, you have an MRI machine in a radius of a kilometer and a half or so. You have five MRI machines. What happens? Patients willy-nilly are made to go into MRI machines. The CEO says that your department hasn't made any profit, it's running at a loss, what are you doing? The poor head of the department is at a loss what to do. Let's have more patients. Whether it's necessary or not, let him have an MRI. He fools himself into saying it is necessary when he realizes in his heart of hearts it need not be done. What is this due to? I think there is a fall in the value system in all aspects of society and in all endeavors of society. And medicine happens to be one of them. It's not an excuse, mind you. It's just giving you the physiopathology as to why medical ethics has suffered badly. Ladies and gentlemen, if you were to ask me what is the most important quality or qualities that a physician must have, I would say, of course, expertise is at the background. He has to be that. He has to have the expertise so that he knows what he's doing and he has the expertise to treat and try the, and get the patient well. But he needs equally important compassion. He needs his humanistic qualities. He needs care. He needs to build a bond between himself and the patient. A doctor-patient relationship. A mutual trusting relationship. An unwritten covenant which has stood the test of time. I'm reminded, I would like to end by the words of an ancient physician in the Middle Ages, a man called Benimoides who made his first treatise on asthma, gave the first book on asthma. And this is what he said. Let me not forget that every patient is a fellow creature in distress or pain. Let me never consider him just a vessel filled with disease. Thank you. <laughs>